I don't know how Sean managed to pull it off, but he's, it's, it's really fickle and shallow. You can't actually orchestrate that. And I think that's what a lot of Nazism is, is just... Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and everybody else, welcome to my video. Today, I'm gonna to be looking at the world's best photojournalism in 2020, specifically looking at the world's best contemporary issues, photojournalism. Let's get started. So if you don't know the premise of these videos, then it's quite simple. Here we take the world's best photojournalism, we look at the pictures devoid of any context, and I try and tell you what's going on in the pictures. Why is it art? Why is it a great photo? And what the story is potentially. But the catch is, I don't know the story. So after I've tried to get all the goodness out of the picture, I'll then have a quick look at the story, and then we'll have a look and see how my reading and your reading of the picture is different. So, without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so the first picture we're going to be looking at is by Sean Davey and it's called Bushfire Evacuation Center. Okay. First thing that I noticed about this image is the color. It's completely bathed in this orange hue and that's obviously because that there's a massive fire going on. You can understand that simply from the title of the photo. Now I think this was taken during the Australian bushfires that happened at the end of last year in 2019. And it makes sense, it was one of the biggest natural disasters that happened last year that and completely took over the news agenda when it happened. But ironically, I don't really remember them actually ever saying that it ended. It just fell off the map. And that's pretty symptomatic of how most mainstream news media works. But what this picture does give you that that doesn't is a focus on the human element of the story. Instead of seeing the fires and the effects that fires have on, say, like the land and nature and the people battling it, instead you've got the people that are affected on the sidelines, namely children in this case. And I think that actually gives such a power to the image because it subverts your expectation. You expect to see a fire. So the second thing that I noticed in the image is the composition. I don't know how Sean managed to pull it off, but he's perfectly put all the children in this arrow formation, which forces the reader's eye to kind of converge in into the center. And where my eye lands is on the girl with her face mask. Now, you can really get a sense of how she moved across the field towards Sean. The way that her uh, shoulders are slanted and her hips are slanted, as well as the convergence of her limbs and how they cross, it gives the idea that she's shimmied away across the lawn, as if she's like almost dancing. You can see that in her hair, the way it's kind of like floating in the air there. And that same kind of free, open body language and gestures can be seen in the other children as well. You've got the girl at the background on the left blowing bubbles. She's got this very open posture and this very long stride. And you can actually see the bubbles right in front of the girl on the left, who's also got her arms very wide open. It almost looks like she's like feeling for some things, like she's almost tentatively putting her hands out because she's worried she's going to bump into things, which would indicate that there's a lot of smoke and fog in the air. And if you actually look in the background, you can see how much smoke's in the air that it's kind of created this slightly grey hue when you look at the camper vans in the background. So that might be the reason why she's doing that. You can also see the boy in the background on the right, and he's got these really open, wacky arms going on, which gives a sense that he's running over in this manic gesture. And finally, you've got the dog in the center with its tail wagging and its ears up and its tongue hanging out. And it gives this kind of playful feeling to the image which really contrasts with what's going on and gives the image a lot of power because it subverts your expectations of what you think is going to be in an image called Bushfire Evacuation Centre. It really is a testament to how kids can adapt to situations that parents would find a lot more difficult. They're completely enveloped in the world of their own imagination. And I think the actual expressions of the children as well, the way that the girl at the front with the mask on, she actually looks directly at the camera and the other kids are almost like unaware that it's there, but they're moving towards it. So they obviously kind of trust it, but you've got the older person on the bike in the background that is moving adjacent, they're moving almost perpendicular to the camera lens. And you can see that he's kind of giving 
but Sean, a side glance, so he's, he's suspicious, which, you know, talks about the nature of kids, they're very trusting in that way. So you've got that dichotomy going on of how children respond to this event to adults. And I think one last thing that I noticed, that, which is a really, really, really cool detail, is what the children are wearing. If you look at the girl at the front with her arms open, the one who's palming in the air, you can see that she's got leaves on her dress and as you look from her and then you look up to the girl with the black shirt on you can see that she's got a seashell on her shirt and then as you move up once again to the boy in the background if you look at his trousers with a skeleton you've got this idea of life slowly descending into death you can't actually orchestrate that this is a candid photo it's photojournalism as i've said before in every other video you cannot stage this stuff yet this iconography of life to death is just really so smart, you, you, so poetic, you could not make it up. It's brilliant. Nice. So now that we've had a look at the image, let's take a look at the context. 31st of December 2019. Abigail Ferris, in mask, plays with friends at a temporary evacuation centre in Bega, New South Wales, Australia. Abigail and her family had been evacuated from a nearby camping spot during bushfires on New Year's Eve. Widespread drought conditions, higher than average temperatures and strong winds triggered devastating bushfires in New South Wales and other regions in Australia, well ahead of the usual bushfire season. By the end of January 2020, more than 30 people had been killed, 3,000 homes lost and around 12.6 million hectares of land burned, nearly three times the size of the Netherlands. The month from February 2017 to the end of 2019 had been the driest on record in New South Wales for any 36-month period. University of Sydney scientists were among those who saw the drought, low humidity and westerly winds as part of the climate emergency. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison faced a public backlash for his response to the fires and for his continuing reluctance to link them to Australia's climate policy. The thing that the context does give that really kind of exaggerates the the difference in the focus of the image and how it's just focusing on the children rather than the actual fire itself is that there was 12.6 million hectares of land burnt in the months that the fire was raging and that's actually three times bigger than the Netherlands which is just you know once again boggling mind-bogglingly large and 3,000 homes were lost and 30 people died. Uh, a billion animals died which is just completely mind-boggling. It also gives a little political backdrop as you know the Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison he faced a big old public backlash if you probably were had your eyes glued to the news or was on social media you probably remember about how he forced to shake the hands of a pregnant lady after you just lost the home as she was asking him what he'd done and why he'd let it get so bad and a lot of the backlash actually came from preparedness for the crisis and then a lack of admittance that this was related to human activity and that was not part of any of Scott Morrison's discussions. So the next image I'm going to take a look at is called Nothing Personal, The Back Office of War by Nikita Tereshin. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, Sam, you've already covered this image, and why do you view it? Yes, I have. I already have. In the first episode of this series, link in the description, I'll provide timestamp in the description as well. It's just a sur such a surreal image. I think what's also cool about it is all it's kind of cubist. The way all the lines kind of intersect and the colours, it kind of, it could almost be like an abstract piece of art. If you kind of squinted your eyes and you took out the, the details of the image, it does look a bit cubist. So the next image we're going to be looking at is called Hitler's Birthday slash Easter Weekend and it's by Mark Peterson. What gets me about this picture is that the last thing I noticed about this picture, which is actually the most obvious part, is about what they're interacting with, who they're interacting with. So obviously they're doing the Sig Heil, but they're all looking beyond the picture. So in the first one we looked at by Sean Davey, we actually had a bit of interaction between the viewer, the camera, and the subject. But in this one, no one's looking at the camera because they're actually saying hi to 
some other people. Now, I would bet that these other people are Nazis and actually just greeting them. <laughs> that really kind of makes me uncomfortable because what, what that communicates is that there's more people like these guys. So there's a lot more hate in the world and you can see that through the obvious stuff beyond them greeting other people that are similar to them, but that's through their symbology. The swastika before it was taken on by the Nazis was actually a Buddhist peace symbol, but it was flipped. So when the Nazis came into power, what they did was they took the peace symbol and they flipped it, and then it became this whole new symbol, taking on a completely whole new meaning. And a similar thing happens in this image when you actually pick it apart and realize what the image would actually communicate without any of the hate symbols. If you would got rid of their swastika tattoos and the swastika flag and, and removed the Sig Heil, this would be quite an ordinary image. I'm guessing this is America because this is pretty culturally normal going out on a lad's trip, going out, you know, boating, yachting, cracking a cold one with the boys. That's pretty normal, but then when you bring in this extreme alt-right element, it just completely warps the image and, and makes it even more surreal. The next thing I want to talk about is the tattoos. Now these guys have got quite a lot of tattoos and each one has different meaning. I'm going to pick on three specifically. So the first one I want to pick is the Brands Rum, which you can see on the guy's clavicle. I tried looking up what Brands Rum meant. I also tried searching for Brands Cum. The only thing that I got was it could be potentially a family name. Now, bear that in mind, why would someone get a tattoo of their family name on the body? I mean, some people do it, but that to me implies that there's a lot of pride in the family. And if I've realized or known anything that racism is learned, it's not innate, you're not born with it, you learn it from people, that ideology is within your family, then you're probably gonna inherit that because you know it's gonna be quite hard to tell them that, that you think this is wrong when you're surrounded by them all the time. And especially if you know they threaten you with booting you out. Maybe it's that, maybe it's an extreme pride in his family which would you know imply that he doesn't have really much uh, diversity in the thought or the influences that he's getting. The other thing that I noticed is the dollar symbol on his right arm. Right wing, capitalism, money, that's pretty simple. That one's pretty on the nose in my opinion all these kind of elements, even the guy's tank top at the back, it's, you know, got 99 problems, but my Bench ain't one. You know, it's like, why why do you have to wear a tank top to let everyone know that you, you've got a bench press? What, are you, what anxieties are you covering up? Because that's what I think all this is, you know, feeling lost, a lack of community, want to meet like-minded people, feeling insecure, having to wear this shirt that lets everyone know that you, you bench, it's, it's, it's really fickle and shallow. And I think that's what a lot of Nazism is, is just, you know, they're not actually being exposed to different, you know, worldviews. From the sense of this picture, that's what I get. There's just a homo homogenous group and they're all this big old echo chamber. So the third tattoo I want to talk about is the one on the guy on the right. It says apotheosis on his chest. Now apotheosis means the perfect example or embodiment of something. Now, to me, that's pretty clear what that's saying. That's um, talking about the Aryan race, the master race, the idea that there is, you know, white, blonde haired, blue eyed male is the epitome of, you know, human creation and that everyone else is below that. It's just unbelievable that there are people that go out there every day of their lives to work and take pictures and interact with these potentially dangerous people. This this stuff, you know, will be part of films that come out in cinemas over the next few years. There will be the based on a true story pictures that people will be like, oh my god, how could this happen, you know? And here they are being printed out in newspapers for people, for everyone to see. Massive props to Mark Peterson and, you know, everyone that I mentioned in these videos for doing what they're doing. So let's take a look at the context behind the image. 19th of April 2019, members of the white supremacist group Shield Wall Network celebrate Hitler's birthday on Lake Dardanelle, Arkansas, USA. Right-wing extremist activity has grown in the US over the past decade, according to a study published by Washington-based think tank, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. The study points to the rise in internet and social media use by far-right groups, connections between local and international groups and political developments in the US as major contributing factors. Although the rise began before Donald Trump began campaigning for the US presidency, 
The study suggests that individuals have been energised by his election. In September, US Homeland Security named white supremacy a leading terrorist threat. FBI Director Christopher Wray later told the House Judiciary Committee that far-right activity posed a steady threat of violence in the US. Okay, so it is what I thought it was. It's US right-wing Nazis, okay? And it says in it how social media and the internet has been used as a big part of trying of connecting and empowering the kind of fringe groups that are in local areas that aren't very active and those that are on, you know, a big international basis. I've read studies and I'll, I'll link a few in the description, but, you know, white nationalism, white terrorism was actually accounting for more deaths and more incidents than any Islamic terrorism. So that just goes to show how much of the news agenda focuses on Muslim or Islamic terror as opposed to white terror. So ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of the video. Before you go, before I leave you, I'd like you to do one thing. Let me know which was your favourite picture. If you thought Sean Davies' picture of the bushfire evacuation centre was your favourite, then please leave a fire emoji in the comment section below and tell me why. If you thought Mark Peterson's picture of Hitler's birthday slash Easter weekend picture was the best, then please leave a face palm emoji because that's only what you can do in the face of bigotry and idiocy. And if you've seen my video on Nikita Tereshin's Nothing Personal, The Back Office of War, then please leave a rocket emoji down below and let me know why you thought that was the best image. With that being said, that is the end of the video. Please give the video a like if you liked it, a dislike if you didn't like it. Comment below, let us know what you want me to cover in future videos. Subscribe if you're that inclined. Hit the notification bell if you're even that inclined. So stay safe, stay vigilant, and I'll see you in the next video. Nice.